So we probably, thank you for waiting, sorry for the delay. Um, we have, we could talk probably because of our personalities and probably because of our field, we could talk forever and ever and often talk too much. Um, and so we're going to try very hard to keep on track this morning. Um, and uh, I just wanted to preface everything by saying that I, uh, this is not meant to be a top-down uh, session more so we would like to have a collab to be as collaborative as possible we will be doing talking and presenting of information and facts but we would really hope to, um, want you to take away that we believe you to be the experts of your own children as well and that this is you're bringing a ton of knowledge and education and experience about stress and anxiety and raising children um, to this room and so we are not the only ones who know a little bit about what we're talking about you know a ton and we welcome that um, my name is Megan Collins for those of you who have not met me and I am one of two now school counselors uh, I've been at Mulgrave this is my eighth year and uh, I come from a background of working in nonprofit and public school education uh, I worked for a nonprofit prior to coming here um, managing youth services. Um, I have a, um, a lot of experience working with all kinds of youth and children and love it. Um, and uh, born and raised in Vancouver and uh, I am married. I have a four-year-old son at home um, which is why I look so exhausted all the time. And, <laughs> um, uh, and I love what I do and I'm so thrilled to have uh, a, a colleague, finally, uh, who brings such a wealth of experience and knowledge um, to our to to us here at Mulgrave. Uh, so, um, and if you have questions or anything, we have a lot of information to share with you. Um, if we don't get to something that you have questions about, please feel free to contact us, email us, and we'll get back to you um, with an answer, hopefully, or some kind of information that you may be looking for. So, I'll just pass it over to Jeff. Hello, I'm Jeff Darcy. My first year at Mulgrave, and I've been loving it here so far, as well as Vancouver. The sunniest place on earth. <laughs> Look at today. Um, actually, I, people have warned me about the rain, and it is tedious after a while, but then you get these breaks like today, and I think you appreciate them more when they're not all the time. Uh, and it is so beautiful here. I have a lot of experience with anxiety and stress and automatic negative thoughts that pop into your head. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm an expert, but it maybe gives me some uh, way to commiserate with anyone else who's struggling with how to manage multiple demands and how to deal with negative self-talk. Uh, and I wanted to start maybe with a short, uh, just guided, little guided meditation for three minutes to just let us kind of notice what's already in our minds and in our bodies and maybe take a moment to just have a different relationship with that because that's kind of where we're ultimately getting with tools to manage stress and anxiety is coming up with a mechanism to like tune back into what's actually going on as opposed to what our minds might be telling us is going on. So I'm going to sit for this if you want to grab a chair mm -hmm. you can. I'm going to ring the bell three times and offer a little bit of guidance. All you need to do is sit there quietly. I invite you to close your eyes because it helps you focus inward. But if for some reason closing your eyes doesn't feel comfortable, just open your eyes and just gaze about a foot in front of you, either on the table or on the floor by your feet. And as with anything, you're not forced to participate in anything you don't want to. If for some reason you don't like this, just sit quietly and I'm open to feedback at the end but this is it's pretty benign so the main thing is as much as possible listen to the sound of the bell specifically as it fades off into nothingness and see if you can notice the exact moment when it stops making sound As the bell fades away into infinity, 
allowing your attention to expand to include all the other sounds in this environment. Not prioritizing any one sound over another. Just allowing all the different sounds to wash over your ears. And as much as possible, adopting a curious attitude about whatever comes up, as opposed to a judgmental attitude. Each time that your mind hijacks your attention away from sound onto some thought or body sensation, just notice where it wandered off to and then gently return your awareness back to sound. You may notice automatic thoughts like, I don't like that sound in the background. I wish I could just focus on this, or my seat's a little uncomfortable, or maybe I didn't have enough coffee, or what if I need to go to the bathroom, or maybe I forgot to give my kid his lunch. These kinds of thoughts happen all the time. They're totally natural. And in fact, each of them gives you an opportunity to strengthen your concentration muscles. Because every time you notice that your mind wandered off, you can then use those muscles to bring your attention back to sound. This is one of the few things in life where there's no right, there's no wrong. You can't mess it up. Whatever you are aware of is simply what you are aware of. No judgments, no evaluation. And when your mind wanders away from an anchor, like sound, or sometimes we use the breath, Each wandering away is just another opportunity to strengthen awareness muscles. And as you'll see in a few moments, this becomes a useful tool in managing day-to-day -day stress and anxiety. If your eyes are not open yet, gradually opening them and bring your awareness back into the room here. That is an example also of what we have done in the middle school, um, in middle school town halls uh, prior to starting. Um, we've been trying to bring the element of mindfulness, in, introdu introduce it to our kids and our students and uh, introduce the practice. We've done it probably four or five times um, between Jeff and other staff members leading a, a short mindfulness exercise. And they've also participated in that uh, in middle school um, in their uh, life and learning classes as well. So um, it, it's uh, something that your, your children have been experiencing. So thank you. Uh, this is a copy of the article that uh, we had emailed out. It's a nice summary article focusing on how to help your teen deal with anxiety. We won't be covering it step by step, but it's a good complement to the presentation here. And if you need copies of it, we can either make you a hard copy or make sure you get the email again. Uh, yeah, who did we email it to? Uh, I believe it may have been linked in Connections on Friday. It, 
if it and if it wasn't, um, we, we it, can get it. We to you will guys. get it to you. We'll yeah. make sure that it's. Um, yeah. It's, so it, it's, we're not going to follow it step by step, but it is something that uh, that is a good summary of kind of what we're talking about and with uh, practical suggestions. So going up here to view slideshow. So we'll start with a, a definition or an attempt to come up with a definition for stress, right? The top line is actually my definition. Uh, we looked up several and they're not always in agreement. Psychologists can't always agree what actually constitutes stress. But it seems to be something like a subjective experience. It's personal. It's idiosyncratic. Each of us has a different way of responding to stress. But it has something to do with when uh, we feel like the demands expected of us or placed on us, our responsibilities, are beyond our capacity or capability to cope in the moment. And it may be that that's just a belief, right? Maybe we're completely capable. Maybe we have so much experience and there's no reason to actually feel stress. But emotions, as we know, aren't logical. They're not rational. And we may end up feeling it anyway. Uh, and certainly, um, that's an uncomfortable position to be in. When you feel like, oh, I've got to perform, I've got to do this thing, people are counting on me, what if I mess up? And that seems to be one of the human being's worst fears, is that they're going to disappoint or they're going to mess up in some way or another, or look foolish. That's why in that famous Harvard study about the top uh, anxieties that people have in life, death came in number three as the third thing that people worry about. But number one, public speaking, yes. <laughs> so part of my talking about this uh, will be also in the moment managing my own <laughs> awareness of anxiety and stress um, because this isn't necessarily something easy. Um, this endocrinologist, Dr. Hans Selye, uh, he came up with a definition of uh, stress and they posted on the American Institute of Stress. They actually have a whole website studying this. And he defines stress as wear and tear on the body. He breaks it down into, he's an endocrinologist which studies the hormones in our body. And he breaks it down to like actual cellular damage that can occur. And we'll look at that in a moment as well. Um, but also acknowledges that it's highly subjective. What one person perceives as stressful, another person might perceive as engaging, exciting. Uh, they might feel in their game. So think about the people you know who maybe work in trauma centers or in the ER or who work uh, at a chaotic uh, agency in the public service where they're dealing with a lot of demands. Some of these people thrive in those environments. Even though it might be considered stressful by majority of people, some people really thrive in those environments. Um, and so that's what we mean about it being a very subjective experience. Um, I like this roller coaster analogy. Some people get on a roller coaster, there's a really steep hill, and their hands are in the air waving and they're cheering and they're screaming and they're having the best time of their life. The person sitting right behind them might be white knuckling it, <laughs> gripping on for dear life. That'd be me. <laughs> afraid, afraid they're gonna get dizzy or uh, disoriented or uh, sick. And for them, it was like a torture machine. <laughs> so that's an example of how the same exact stimuli and the same exact experience can be interpreted very differently by different people. Um, and again, a lot of it has to do with our judgment. I mentioned in that brief meditation, uh, it's common for judgments to come up. Every moment we have this constant commentary going through our minds of like, oh, I gotta remember this thing on my to-do list, and uh, what is this person talking about, and do I like this? Is it? Do I like the weather today? Do I like the food here? Are my clothes comfortable? What about this person who's speaking? Can I relate to him? Can I relate to her? Um, that's just natural. But that constant evaluating of whether you, something is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral is part of what determines whether we experience something as stressful or anxious. Um, it's not necessarily the actual circumstances. Uh, another one I think of is Christmas Eve and as kids. Many times I remember not being able to fall asleep. Very excited, Santa's gonna come bring some gifts. Uh, it's a similar feeling you might have the night before going on a trip. You might be like super excited for vacation and you can't sleep because all these exciting, wonderful thoughts are swirling through your head. That's a very different experience 
than not being able to go to sleep because you have insomnia, because you're worrying about your relationship, and maybe you're heading for a divorce. Or one of your kids is uh, really struggling at school, and you're not sure what the problem is, and so you're up at night worrying about that. Though that kind of insomnia is usually experienced as more unpleasant. Um, so the idea is, though, that it's not just across the board one way or another for one person. Can I just press return? Uh, no, just the right arrow. Oh, yeah. got it. So that's the, that's the, um, the website for stress, uh, American Institute of Stress, where they offer that definition. Um, and one of the things that I want to maybe suggest is we often feel like when we have control, some semblance or uh, ability to control the circumstances of our life, that that is less stressful. And on some level, that is true. But I, might, I want to offer the other possibility that maybe by learning to embrace uncertainty and our powerlessness or lack of control, that that might also be a key to freedom and a key to managing stress and anxiety. Is any, if anyone familiar with 12-step programs like Alcoholics Anonymous or uh, Al-Anon or Overeaters Anonymous, all of these 12-step self-help groups, the first step to recovery, to healthy living, is actually this, admitting we were powerless, powerless over alcohol or other drugs, powerless over food um, or gambling. It's that first step of admitting that you're not in control that leads to recovery. And so think about that possibly in relation to stress and anxiety as well. Do you want to ask this? So, yeah. is stress bad for our health? <laughs> ask, what, what, what do you think? What, what do Show you hands. know? Who thinks stress Show is bad for your health? Raise your hands. Yeah? yeah. yeah? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, that's... The, we'll take a well, let's look, look at a video uh, that gives a description of stress, and this might actually reinforce some of your beliefs and understandings as they exist. And I will switch over to this for that. Uh, quick time, there we go. In a busy world with unending work and responsibilities piling up, stress can get to the best of us. But how bad is it for you, really? Can stress actually kill you? From a biological perspective, stress makes perfect sense. If you're about to get chomped on by a bear, your stress hormones better kick your butt into gear. But it turns out that your mortgage, unemployment, and looming exam all trigger the same stress response in your body. And unlike most animals, which eventually experience a major decrease in these hormones, humans can't seem to find the off switch. Even though it's not life and death, our psychological woes consistently bathe our bodies in these hormones, making our heart pound, muscles tense, and stomach turn. In Japan, they have the term koroshi, which literally translates to death from overwork. In what is now deemed an overworking epidemic, these individuals who are seemingly healthy and in their prime suddenly die. After being officially recognized and documented in Japan, these sudden heart attacks and strokes were quickly linked to stress. But how does stress cause this? Cortisol is one of the main stress hormones which helps divert energy to where you need it and- Let me just pause it there for a second. So the key point here is that uh, humans, like all other animals, have this mechanism to respond in an emergency uh, to a life-threatening situation, a bear attacking you, uh, a warring tribe that wants to steal your food. And we sometimes call this the fight, flight, or freeze response, and it's from the back of the brain, a very primitive part of the brain. And it is old, and it is highly developed, and it is fast. And it kicks in well before our frontal lobes the reasoning, rational part of our brain that we sometimes associate as making us human beings and civilized, that's much slower and later to evolve in, in human history. Um, so that's why this, the, the stress response like happens before we even have a chance to think about it or intervene. The problem with humans is like now we don't live as hunter-gatherers in the wild where this was actually advantageous for survival. Now we end up having mm, not life-threatening situations trigger the same stress response. So they might be serious, like my partner's cheating on me, oh my gosh, and that is a serious concern, but it's not gonna kill you in the moment. But yet our bodies react as if we need to be in that state of alert awareness and ready to fight back, ready to run away, or ready to freeze right there, and we don't have a way to shut it off. 
So all these hormones end up circulating in our bodies. And now he's going to talk about the slightly specific ways that they actually can do damage. From non-essential functions of the body. But with chronic stress exposure, problems arise. The immune system shuts down, inflammation is inhibited, white blood cells are reduced, and susceptibility to disease increases. Some evidence also suggests that prolonged stress may be involved in the development of cancer. When looking at the arteries of macaque monkeys, those under significant stress have more clogged arteries. This prevents blood from getting to the heart quickly during stress and can ultimately lead to a heart attack. The brain also takes a toll. When looking at mice exposed to stress, we see dramatically smaller brain cells with fewer branch extensions than normal mice. This is particularly prevalent in the areas associated with memory and learning, which may stir up some memories for you of those wonderful all-night study sessions. The acute stress and sleep deprivation can make it increasingly difficult to remember the things we want to. Perhaps the most telling story is in our DNA. We contain something called telomeres at the end of our chromosomes, which decrease in size with our age. Our video on aging here explains this process. Eventually, the telomeres run out, at which point the cell stops duplicating and dies. So telomeres are directly related to aging and length of life. And it turns out, stress may actually accelerate the shortening of these telomeres. But not all hope is lost for the perpetually stressed. Another hormone, oxytocin, has been shown to reduce this stress response. It helps your blood vessels relax and even regenerates the heart from stress-related damage. So how do we get more oxytocin? It's sometimes dubbed the cuddle hormone because it's released during positive social interactions and while caring for others. People who spend more time with others create a buffer or resilience to stress. So when life gets the best of you, just remember, you don't have to go it alone. Spend some time with those you love. It may just save your life. Got a burning question you want to answer? Okay. Ask it in the comments. Okay. Where is it? Oh, I know. Do you want to go ahead? Um, so, has anyone seen that video before? I, I hadn't seen it actually, yeah. And, and uh, I think it, it, it's an interesting um, concept to think about that we, well the fight, flight or, f or freeze response. And I think um, just the fact that the, the big key point from, from that, the takeaway from me was the oxytocin. And the fact that we can actually counterbalance and, and um, balance things out in our system when that hormone is produced, and that it is also a stress hormone, and we're going to talk a little bit about that later as well. Um, yeah, but I mean, that the compassion and the human connection and caring for others and giving is actually um, healthy and, and can, can help us achieve some kind of balance when, with our stress levels and our hormones. Yeah. Question. In this video, the example is more the definition of the bad stress. Mm -hmm. Would the same apply with the good stress? Let's say if I travel a lot, and <laughs> if I, like the nice things that mm -hmm. I do, as, would the same process apply as well? Does it shorten my life? So that's actually a very good question, and I'm going to put a bookmark there. We'll get we'll get to that later because there, there's a there's a piece they missed I think in that video mm -hmm. that's kind of important, and we'll, we have another video that may yeah. explain that a little better. But that's the big question: Is stress something uh, that causes strong feelings of worry or anxiety? and is a strain uh, on our ability to cope with demands, meaning it, it makes us worse at coping with life. Or maybe is it body's way of rising to a challenge and preparing to face a difficult situation that we need to face? And I'm not going to answer that yet, but that's, the, that's one of the big questions. Let's first look into some of the signs that you may be experiencing stress or someone you love or care about may be experiencing stress. Uh, you can look in the body section there's a lot of common symptoms that could be a lot of different things, but these are some of the ways that stress manifests in the body. Mm -hmm. Exhaustion, fatigue, um, changes in sleep, uh, heart rate increased. A lot of people get nausea or uh, intestinal distress, some kind of digestion difficulties. Um, accompanied with, in the mind, what I alluded to in the guided meditation, that constant, what I sometimes call the monkey mind, that bounces from idea to idea, the way a monkey might bounce from tree to tree in the jungle on the vines. Um, I think also just keeping in mind, depending on the age of your child, they will present differently. Um, so 
um, my son will say his he experiences stress in his stomach and he'll say my stomach is sore or I, I you know my tummy hurts that kind of thing and I know he's worrying about something so um, just keeping in mind how old your child is and where they're at developmentally um, you may s I mean and some of these also point to um, you know being annoyed or uh, w forgetful that kind of thing could also be other issues could also be the teenage years could be that they're just your child is just scattered so in and of itself one or two of these things may not indicate that there's an issue or that there's something to be addressed but um, in mostly those are sort of the common signs that we might see yeah and again is it something that actually helps you perform better mm -hmm. well if one of the symptoms you're experiencing is problems concentrating, maybe not, right? But maybe if you're hyper-focused and that is uh, interfering with your ability to perform in some way for some reason, perhaps that might be an adaptive thing, I'm not sure. And then behavioral things you may notice. Um, avoidance, not wanting to do homework or school, not wanting to go to uh, social events or sporting events. Um, grades going down, different um, feedback coming back from teachers that students not outputting as much work as usual, uh, procrastination, again that's another thing, another common behavioral uh, sign. Go for this? So some of the common causes that we all know about, this is not new to us, school, I mean we're, we're in a school, we're talking about our kids and ourselves, but um, school is a huge, huge, can be a huge stressor for our kids. There's the, the myriad of things that come at them every single day, the things that they have to juggle, um, the academics, the expectations, the, the, the time management, not to mention the social aspects of school. Um, do I fit in? Where do I belong? Am I connected? Who are my friends? What do I look like today? Uh, how does my uniform fit? How are we going to do in this basketball game after school? So that, uh, you know, some of the things that Jeff's been talking about with that monkey mind, I mean, we all experience it, but I think sometimes we underestimate what our children are, are going through every single day. Um, and, they, and oftentimes I think what happens is they kind of hold it together here, and then you get to see <laughs> the, uh, the other side of it when, um, they're able to be at home, and then it all, sometimes all just comes out with the tears or the you know an annoying anger. I can't do this, or this isn't working. Um, home, family connections, relationships. If there's something happening in our homes or our lives that is distressing for us as adults, you can bet it's going to be distressing for your child. And also remembering that uh, adolescence is a time of gradual separation and the child individuating. So part of that's going to be. Mm -hmm creating separation and it's going to maybe feel conflictual as, as yeah. parents you may not be ready to let your child grow up that fast and certainly they may be wanting to separate faster than is safe and that negotiation is different for every family and it can result in challenges. Uh, and then our, the concept of self and how, how we're thinking about ourselves and some of the the, uh, there's a psychologist that talks about three gatekeepers being are the goals, the, our, the ambitions that we have for ourselves. How reasonable are they? What are our expectations of ourselves? Yeah, go next one. Um, how much do we want to accomplish? And our standards, how well we perform all the time. And that can, you know, do we have expectations of ourselves that we have to be perfect? That we have to, or in our children's case, that they have to get that certain grade. They have to get that certain feedback or um, accomplishment done uh, academically um, or you know be the highest scoring basketball player or the best performer in the band or singer uh, and then also managing the limits that we set for ourselves um, so can your child say no are they a people pleaser um, can you say no are you how are you imp implementing boundaries and limits for yourself um, and knowing knowing what your bottom line is or when you're taking on too much and need to step back and so uh, as mr. Darcy said that that the adolescence is an age of um, gaining independence um, differentiation from you and from it from each other and we want them to be able to think about these things and set reasonable expectations, have reasonable goals, and, and be able to have, know what their limits and their boundaries are because anytime they exceed those things, the flip side is um, the, you know, perfectionism, the, they, they can't say no. So then they've taken on too much. How many co-curriculars is your child in? 
Uh, are they feeling like they can manage it? Is it bringing joy and passion or are they like, oh my gosh, now I have to do this and you have to go to this lesson and you have to do that. So it, it, and so that goes for all of us, I think. It's a, they're, they're good things to think about in life in general as far as how we mitigate what's coming at us and how we respond in the world. I'm thinking about Mulgrave culture and the IB values. One of them is pursuit of excellence, right? So we value that as a good thing. I think it crosses over to perfectionism when that valuing of excellence becomes a uh, limiter of performance. So that, like, that drive towards excellence actually interferes with your ability to be more excellent. Then we're in the realm of perfectionism. Does that seem? Okay. Uh, this is a diagram the college counselor at my last school used to keep on her door. And it's the idea that what most people think is that there's two roads. You either you win or you fail, right? Um, but what most successful people know to be true is that that's not accurate. That when you are a winner, it didn't just come naturally for most people, 99.9% .9 of the people. It involved multiple failures along the road. Yeah, and this, if you want, you can Google uh, like success failure or what most people know about success and this is one of the first images that pops up on Google Images. It's and I have to say that um, our middle school students have seen something similar to this. Last year Mr. Jones had something up um, and has discussed it with the students uh, and, and I think it was also maybe shown at an assembly at the end of the year. And we've um, actually, we're just talking about uh, in the upcoming town halls for middle school at least, uh, having staff members get up and mm -hmm. relay a story of a failure in their life, some time that they didn't, weren't perfect, uh, and how they lived through it. You know, and that maybe it was ultimately beneficial to them, or maybe it was just an example of, I could live through a failure, right? And that is a way to not kind of normalize that this is actually part of success. Go ahead. Um, you were just discussing about middle school. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, no, we're not um, only directing it to the middle school. I actually went into the character ed classes for all grade 12 students right now who are doing their uh, university applications. And we did two sessions of uh, mindfulness and understanding anxiety and the, the monkey mind. And so that was two like hour long sessions of experiential asking questions, trying things out. Um, and I'm up in the senior school regularly, and Ms. Collins works with a lot of senior it's school also, students as well. It's uh, also this year with the implementation of character education um, classes, a lot of what we're talking about, and, and, and um, I've been talking about middle school because I've done so much in the middle school, but this year there's been significant implementation in the character education classes to discuss these kinds of things. Um, and having Jeff come in and do mindfulness as well. And so they're uh, starting at the grade 10 level, it's, it's starting. Um, absolutely. Uh, because, yes, grade 10 is an interesting year. Grade 11 and 12 with the diploma program bring all kinds of different sets of challenges. So. Um, another source of stress, and I just put this up there, some of you might have heard of FOMO, fear of missing out. The idea that you can't do everything, right? You might have this hockey game and that play performance and this friend's birthday party and your grandmother's uh, anniversary, but they all happen on a Saturday and how do you do them all? And so sometimes your teenager or you might be going through this experience of like, ah, how do I know which is the right place to be and I can't be ever at once, fear of missing out. I've also sometimes heard it, heard it called FMS instead of PMS, it's fear of missing something. So yeah, but that's another source of stress for some people. Um, so this is Dr. Yeah. Pickard, and he's the one who talked about the gatekeepers, of the ambition, um, the goals, uh, and, and the three gatekeepers. Um, and again, just commenting on the fact that we want to help our, stu our children monitor their expectations of themselves so that eventually, and we want to do this now, so that by the time they're entering first and second year university, they've had practice and they've had the ability and time to think about um, uh, how to mitigate what's coming their way. Um, so that when they're on their own, they're away from you, they, they have already had some experience um, implementing some of these things on their own. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the stress response 
was adaptive perhaps 10,000 years ago when we were hunter-gatherers and less adaptive now in most situations. We get worked up over things that are not life-threatening and that could be damaging, could be harmful potentially. Um, there's also something called the negativity bias of the brain that we actually have a tendency, a bias to worry about stuff and that that was also adaptive once upon a time. And so if you look at the quality or the nature of the thoughts that automatically pop into all of our brains, they probably tend towards the negative. Some people more than others, again, we all have different personalities and genetics that influence these things. Um, but I call them ants or automatic negative thoughts. Uh, you can think about ants crawling around the brain is one way to um, imagine it. There's actually a graphic for that on Google Images, believe it or not. Um, and, and that actually, that self-talk, those automatic negative thoughts, are hugely responsible for our mood and our emotions. Um, it's hard to say. Some people, it's the chicken and egg thing. Do the negative thoughts come first and then we feel a certain way? Or do we feel a certain way and we construct thoughts to try to explain why we feel that way? I think it works both ways, myself. Sometimes you just feel in a bad way and then your brain wants to construct a story about it. Like, I must be feeling bad because of the weather. I must be feeling bad because Johnny doesn't like me anymore or whatever, right? Like, um, so it could work either way, but the point is we've learned that intervening at the level of self-talk and catching yourself when you're having uh, an exaggerated, distorted, or um, just inaccurate thought that's kind of going through your head, that you can actually step out of it in the way we practiced mindfulness earlier and let it go. And not that you have to push it away. It's not a, a forceful, active thing. It's more about accepting that it's there, but you don't have to believe it, right? Just because you think it doesn't mean it's true. That's one of my mantras, and I try mm -hmm. to convey that to everyone. Similarly with emotions, just because you feel it doesn't mean it's true. It might be a very real emotion, and it might cause your heart to race, it might cause you to have some stomach upset, you might even get sweatier, you might get the jitters. So you actually have real physical responses to this emotion, but if it's based on an erroneous thought or an exaggerated, distorted belief, then it's not based on reality. Oh, so does anyone have a phone they can Google, is stress bad for your health, real quick? No? All right. So I just want to get this, like, it, many of us have this belief that stress is bad for our health, right? And, and kind of objectively or categorically. When you Google it, usually you get a whole page of hits with different articles showing you just how bad stress is for your health. So I just want to see what some of the articles that come up are, what some of the hits that come up are. Can you read, like, uh, Oh, it's a little slow. <laughs> Anyone get through yet? Can you can you read the first two or three? I get uh, the definition. Okay, it's in paid ad. Nine yeah. of stress in, is more dangerous than you think. Okay. How stress affects your health. Uh huh. Uh, the American Psychological Association. The effect of stress to, on your body. Good stress and bad stress. Okay, so there's some indicator that there might be such a thing as good stress. Yeah. So let's go on to this other video that kind of rocked my world a little bit and made me question a lot of what I knew about stress or thought I knew about stress. I have a confession to make. But first, I want you to make a little confession to me. In the past year, I want you to just raise your hand if you've experienced relatively little stress. Anyone? Mm -hmm. How about a moderate amount of stress? Who's experienced a lot of stress? Yeah, <laughs> me too. But that is not my confession. My confession is this. I am a health psychologist, and my mission is to help people be happier and healthier. But I fear 
that something I've been teaching for the last 10 years is doing more harm than good. And it has to do with stress. For years, I've been telling people stress makes you sick. It increases the risk of everything from the common cold to cardiovascular disease. Basically, I've turned stress into the enemy. But I've changed my mind about stress. And today, I want to change yours. Let me start with the study that made me rethink my whole approach to stress. This study tracked 30,000 adults in the United States for eight years. And they started by asking people, how much stress have you experienced in the last year? They also asked, do you believe that stress is harmful for your health? And then they used public death records to find out who died. <laughs> okay. Some bad news first. People who experienced a lot of stress in the previous year had a 43% increased risk of dying. But that was only true for the people who also believed that stress is harmful for your health. <laughs> people who experienced a lot of stress but did not view stress as harmful were no more likely to die. In fact, they had the lowest risk of dying of anyone in the study, including people who had relatively little stress. Now, the researchers estimated that over the eight years they were tracking deaths, 182,000 Americans died prematurely, not from stress, but from the belief that stress is bad for you. <laughs> that is over 20,000 deaths a year. Now, if that estimate is correct, that would make believing stress is bad for you the 15th largest cause of death in the United States last year, killing more people than skin cancer, HIV, AIDS, and homicide. You can see why this study freaked me out. Here I've been spending so much energy telling people stress is bad for your health. So this study got me wondering, can changing how you think about stress make you healthier? And here the science says yes. When you change your mind about stress, you can change your body's response to stress. Now, to explain how this works, I want you all to pretend that you are participants in a study designed to stress you out. It's called the social stress test. You come into the laboratory and you're told you have to give a five-minute impromptu speech on your personal weaknesses to a panel of expert evaluators sitting right in front of you. And to make sure you feel the pressure, there are bright lights and a camera in your face, kind of like this. And the evaluators have been trained to give you discouraging nonverbal feedback, <laughs> like this. <sighs> now that you're sufficiently demoralized, time for part two, a math test. And unbeknownst to you, the experimenter has been trained to harass you during it. Now, we're going to all do this together. It's going to be fun for me. OK. <laughs> I want you all to count backwards from 996 in increments of seven. You're going to do this out loud as fast as you can, starting with 996. Go. Go faster. Faster, please. You're going too slow. Stop, 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 stop. That guy made a mistake. We're going to have to start all over again. <laughs> You're not very good at this, are you? OK, so you get the idea. Now, if you were actually in this study, you'd probably be a little stressed out. Your heart might be pounding. You might be breathing faster, maybe breaking out into a sweat. And normally, we interpret these physical changes as anxiety or signs that we aren't coping very well with the pressure. But what if you viewed them instead as signs that your body was energized, was preparing you to meet this challenge? Now, that is exactly what participants were told in a study conducted at Harvard University. Before they went through the social stress test, they were taught to rethink their stress response as helpful. That pounding heart is preparing you for action. 
If you're breathing faster, it's no problem. It's getting more oxygen to your brain. And participants who learned to view the stress response as helpful for their performance, well, they were less stressed out, less anxious, more confident. But the most fascinating finding to me was how their physical stress response changed. Now, in a typical stress response, your heart rate goes up and your blood vessels constrict like this. And this is one of the reasons that chronic stress is sometimes associated with cardiovascular disease. It's not really healthy to be in this state all the time. But in the study, when participants viewed their stress response as helpful, their blood vessels stayed relaxed like this. Their heart was still pounding, but this is a much healthier cardiovascular profile. It actually looks a lot like what happens in moments of joy and courage. Over a lifetime of stressful experiences, this one biological change could be the difference between a stress-induced heart attack at age 50 and living well into your 90s. And this is really what the new science of stress reveals, that how you think about stress matters. So my goal as a health psychologist has changed. I no longer want to get rid of your stress. I want to make you better at stress. And we just did a little intervention. If you raised your hand and said you'd had a lot of stress in the last year, we could have saved your life. Because hopefully the next time your heart is pounding from stress, you're going to remember this talk, and you're going to think to yourself, this is my body helping me rise to this challenge. And when you view stress in that way, your body believes you, and your stress response becomes healthier. Now, I said, I have over a decade of demonizing stress to redeem myself from. So we are going to do one more intervention. I want to tell you about one of the most underappreciated aspects of the stress response. And the idea is this. Stress makes you social. To understand the side of stress, we need to talk about a hormone, oxytocin. And I know. Oxytocin has already gotten as much hype as a hormone can get. It even has its own cute nickname, the cuddle hormone, because it's released when you hug someone. But this is a very small part of what oxytocin is involved in. Oxytocin is a neurohormone. It fine-tunes your brain's social instincts. It primes you to do things that strengthen close relationships. Oxytocin makes you crave physical contact with your friends and family. It enhances your empathy. It even makes you more willing to help and support the people you care about. Some people have even suggested we should snort oxytocin right? <laughs> to become more compassionate and caring. But here's what most people don't understand about oxytocin. It's a stress hormone. Your pituitary gland pumps this stuff out as part of the stress response. It's as much a part of your stress response as the adrenaline that makes your heart pound. And when oxytocin is released in the stress response, it is motivating you to seek support. Your biological stress response is nudging you to tell someone how you feel instead of bottling it up. Your stress response wants to make sure you notice when someone else in your life is struggling so that you can support each other. When life is difficult, your stress response wants you to be surrounded by people who care about you. Okay, so how is knowing this side of stress going to make you healthier? Well, oxytocin doesn't only act on your brain, it also acts on your body. And one of its main roles in your body is to protect your cardiovascular system from the effects of stress. It's a natural anti-inflammatory. It also helps your blood vessels stay relaxed during stress. But my favorite effect on the body is actually on the heart. Your heart has receptors for this hormone. And oxytocin helps heart cells regenerate and heal from any stress-induced damage. This stress hormone strengthens your heart. And the cool thing is, is that all of these physical benefits of oxytocin are enhanced by social contact and social support. 
So when you reach out to others under stress, either to seek support or to help someone else, you release more of this hormone, your stress response becomes healthier, and you actually recover faster from stress. I find this amazing that your stress response has a built-in mechanism for stress resilience. And that mechanism is human connection. So let's pause there. <clears throat> Pardon me. The mechanism is human connection. That's the connection even with the first video that didn't talk about oxytocin directly as a stress hormone, <coughs> but did talk about the benefits of uh, social connection, affection, uh, and altruism, actually, as uh, curative of the degenerative effects of stress and adrenaline and cortisol. Um, she goes on in the next few minutes to talk about another study that looked at people who do volunteer work and otherwise caring for others and how that is a huge benefit and protector against the damages of stress. And it's kind of like simple yet profound, this idea that compassion, connection, caring, um, love really is a prescription for health. I think one of the things that stands out for me uh, is because I have a lot of questions about this because I've also come up through you know stress is going to kill us it's bad for us la la la. W one of the things I see w with our students a lot is oh my god I'm so stressed out I can't do this oh my god oh my god I, I, I've got this got this done and oh no I can't I can't possibly do that because I have to do this that and the other thing and and Yes, our students are busy, our kids are busy, life is busy. But for me, where there's, uh, what I love about this is there, uh, there's some, ho it, it creates some hope that, and I think a normalization of our body's response and it's how we think about it. So, it, and it's gonna be uncomfortable, right? It's, I, I think it's, what, what we try to do as human beings is get away as quickly as possible from anything from discomfort of any kind, vulnerability of any kind. It's too, it's too hard to stay there, it's too overwhelming. So one of the things that we, we work with students on is just sort of accepting what it is. Where can you, what can you do in different areas of your life to manage and mitigate, to maybe balance more, maybe lessen, or maybe it's that you do have to white knuckle this for the next couple days to get this, this project done. But, but it's not going to kill you in and of itself. And if you understand how your body's responding and come to terms with it, instead of going, uh, trying to fight it so hard. It's that fighting that creates even more anxiety for our kids, I think, and for us as well. So I, I and the oxytocin, again, I keep coming back to the oxytocin piece and that it, it's actually moving us to connect with one another, to seek help, to talk. And, and uh, I, th I think that's a, a, brilliant, a brilliant connection to make. Yeah. So. We probably want to go into questions, yeah. right? Because yeah. we're getting near the yeah. end we, of our time. Uh, so I'm curious what this, what questions this has raised, because it certainly did raise some for me. How are you surprised by some of this, or have you heard this before? Well, it's also positive stress. It's also called you stress, isn't it? Or they used to call it. You I do stress. remember mm -hmm. hearing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And even athletes rely on that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think for me, again, it's about context because my, my first thoughts are I go to the fact that I'm not I'm not concerned about m my stress levels and what I'm stressed about are very different than somebody who's living in a country where they're fearing for their lives or their or anywhere in the lower mainland where you don't know where you're gonna how you're gonna put food on the table that's a very different kind of stress um, and a very different kind of lived experience and so I think I feel like I need to qualify, and, and, and that's Kelly McGonigal. She's out of Berkeley, California. She raised a whole lot of ruckus with this. Um, and, but I think the science is, and her colleagues are coming around, and she's not saying that stress is not, chronic stress is not bad. Um, but, I, but I do think it's an interesting shift and in, in, in keeps with the mindfulness aspect of how we are, are approaching what's happening in our lives um, and encouraging our kids to uh, be comfortable with discomfort. And there's a quote here. Uh, oh, 
Sorry, over here. yeah, wrong computer. I think I showed this the last time when I was on my own doing this, but Lynn Lyons is a, a psychologist out of the United States, and she's written this book, Anxious Kids, Anxious Parents, which is fantastic, and I really love her. She's got a website. She's got great information on there. She's often contributing to the psychological community and the therapist community, just encouraging our, our kids to step out of their comfort zone. And it's hard because, <laughs> well, it's hard for any of us, but, and, and again, coming back and linking back to the idea that you're gonna fail. You're gonna maybe not do as well as you want. Uh, and that's okay. And it's what you do with it. How, so what have you, wh where do you want to go from here? As opposed to letting it define who you are and, and what you do, it's, it's what you do with it and how we manage it. And, and we have to practice. And we want them to practice failing now because we don't want them going off to university never having failed and being able to pick themselves back up or learn how to ask for help, um, know their limits and their boundaries. Uh, because they're going to be that much farther away from us and without this necessarily the embedded already circles of support. So um, we want them to start to do these things now. It's part of growing up. It's part of evolving and maturing. Um, All of this is consistent with the message from uh, mindfulness and meditation. And uh, the more we accept what happens to us, whether it's in our bodies, in our minds, in our emotions, in our hearts, it seems to be better, the better off we are. The more we resist what's happening, the more suffering we endure. Uh, there's an equation I like, pain times resistance equals suffering. We can't control the pain. I have a magic wand in my office. I actually got it from my five-year-old niece in Disney World. And uh, she, I told her that I work with students and that sometimes having a magic wand makes them feel better. And so she's like, I want you to have this to make your students feel better. Um, but the truth is, it's a plastic magic wand from Cinderella's castle. So I can't remove people's pain. I can't remove the disappointments in their life, the, the cheerleading squad they didn't get picked for, the basket they missed in the team in the game, and uh, the grades that they didn't get, um, or the person who broke up with them, right? We all have these, if we haven't had disappointment yet, mm -hmm. but as we get older, we're gonna experience that. Our, our loved ones are gonna get sick, they're gonna die. I mean, there's, that's the reality of this life, it's temporary. Um, but when we don't resist it, it just, it's just pain. When we tell ourselves this shouldn't be happening, I should have gotten a better grade, I shouldn't, you know, I don't deserve to get this cancer diagnosis, he's a good father, like, you know, why did he get in that car accident? Like, these are tragedies and they're unfortunate, but when we resist them, we make the pain worse, it becomes suffering. And if we reduce the resistance to it, and by doing that, again, by practicing acceptance, by practicing mindfulness and uh, not attaching to the story we tell ourselves, that seems to be one of the keys to freedom. So the, the, the article that is, we, c we can make sure that you get, talks a lot more in detail about sort of the concrete practical things. And so just to mention things like monitoring sleep, <laughs> especially as you get into the senior school, that's harder and harder to do. With our students, I find you know kids telling me that they're staying up till three or four in the morning, multiple nights in a row, and, and, um, and then expecting to, to function and, and perform the next day or the following few days. Um, exercise, you know, fresh air, taking breaks, time management, um, and, and those are all things that not only you can support, but we can also support, and, and their advisors can. Um, and our, our, you know, our principals looking a lot at the, the ability to, what are you taking on, where, where are your priorities, and understanding that, ac even academically, that their priorities are going to shift, and I, um, particularly in the senior school. I think a lot of our students feel like they have to, they, they look at the whole picture, and how can you not, but then they feel like they, they, they have to put equal amount of time or get the same amount or the, achieve the same results in everything. And it's, I'm constantly saying, well, something's always going to have to come to the top and sort of other things are going to have to shift. And then it's, it, it's this game and this dance that you have to do. And that's part of the acceptance as well. Um, but some of the practical things are in this art article or mentioned in the article. Um, reaching out for support. You, com you communicating with your kids, no matter how old they are, you know, being coming from a curious place. Uh, so what was that like for you? Oh, it seems like you're really frustrated that, or it must be really hard w to get a four when you were really looking for, hoping for a six, or, um, you know, you, you flubbed on your choir solo. 
yikes, that must feel, you know. So just be, coming alongside your children, listening to what they have to say, um, and stealing yourself against some of the, the backlog, the attitude, or the, oh, mom, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but but also, you, also reaching out to each other yeah. for support as parents, because raising a teenager today is different than it was 20 years ago, and it will continue to get different as technology changes our lives and the ways we interact socially. Um, so you guys probably, on the practical nitty-gritty level, know more about how to manage mm -hmm. this and support your kids than, than we do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just a little note that on January, is it January 12th, I yeah, think? Yeah, Thursday. Thursday, we get back. at 8.30 in the morning, I believe we'll be downstairs, but we'll, that will be, is to be determined. Um, but it Jeff is the 12th. and I and Melissa Moore and Martin Jones invite you to come and have a conversation with us about being a parent of a teen. Um, and challenges and all the things that come along with it and it's it's more we would uh, hope and are hoping that it's more of a dialogue um, as opposed to a workshop or anything like that just around how and how everyone's doing and creating some connection amongst us in the community um, what are some of the challenges that you are experiencing and also a chance to brainstorm mm -hmm. uh, p future parenting sessions like this and targeting topics that we may actually get some expert speakers in on those topics. We may uh, come up with a, a presentation or a, a workshop around some of those topics. But this initial one is kind of a sussing out what's the need? What, it, what are you guys seeing? What are you guys hearing from uh, other parents? Yeah, and that'll be after the break. So thank you for coming. Yeah, any questions? Busy, busy time comments? of year. Yeah. It would be it would be life and learning in the middle school and character education in the senior school, and then different lesson plans in the junior school would be addressing different on a, di a different yeah, scale, um, yeah. but uh, definitely very concretely in life and learning and and character ed around managing time or yeah. how do you even from, from time management to social interaction to uh you know family relationships and what do you do where do you go for support um if if anybody has any questions about uh where to go whether it's to us or if you want some resources for the community please don't hesitate to let us know um, there's a ton a ton of fantastic resources in our community and online uh, where you can find more information about how to support your child or yourself with anxiety stress um, parenting in and of itself so and just want to encourage you all to be gentle and compassionate with yourselves because I think you're doing the hardest job on the planet with and uh, the most important job on the planet so thank you for coming thank you guys